Hello friends, and welcome to Lecture Preparation for the 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time, which this year falls uh, November 19th, 2017, and this would be the, uh, this is the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. It's all coming to happen soon. I always think of the holidays as like a roller coaster ride once it gets started. You just can't <laughs> stop it. It's just, you just gotta, you just gotta kind of go with things and hope that you're well prepared and to avoid being too uh, uh, stressed out, you just have to uh, be able to accept whatever, however you're prepared, and that <laughs> that's, that's right. just going to be what it's going to be. Where did it rise? We uh, prepare in October. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's about what it takes. Um, so, uh, yeah, this first reading is from the book of Proverbs, and uh, it's one of my favorite readings from the Old Testament because this one was one that we had read for my mother's funeral, and uh, uh, and this is the way my my siblings and I always thought of her as just being such a. Um, she was a hard wor- working mother. Did you, I mean, but she was she was very loving too. But she just worked really hard. There were eight of us kids, and and she had to work pretty hard, you know, to to do it. And and uh, I'm sure those of you have who have lost your mothers, you miss her. And those who have her, make sure that you. Uh, take care of her and and be with her, especially in these holidays coming up. So I'm on page 282 of your your workbook, and at the bottom of the reading, the commentary reads, the reading from Proverbs is part of the instructions given to King Lemuel by his mother. She warns him of the pitfalls of strong drink, then reminds him to take care of the poor and be a champion for the needy. As she cautions him about wasting his strength, on women, she describes the kind of woman he should seek. <laughs> I'm listening, I'm leading in between the lines here. A woman of strength, translated in our reading as worthy. Strength, often associated with physical or military competence, has a much broader meaning, including social, political, practical, and intellectual dimensions. Most importantly, like the king himself, his wife should be characterized by a strength that encompasses virtuous living and wisdom. The poem is organized by the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, with each verse beginning with a consecutive letter, opening with the first, Aleph, and and concluding with the last, Tav. These similar structures found in the psalm, like similar structures found in the psalms, the acrostic pattern is orderly and complete, presenting the perfect wife as a paragon of goodness worth more than rubies. To such a woman, a man entrusts his heart. Long recognized as the symbol of love, the heart indicates a person's in, innermost being. The cap- capacities of mind and will and emotion referring to a person in totality. The couple is thus united at the deepest level. The worthy, strong wife exercises her skills both in the household and in the broader society, obtaining wool and flax and plying the spindle were signs of an accomplished woman, one who would take responsibility for maintaining her maintaining the home. Yet, like her husband, she looks beyond the home, reaching out to the poor and needy. The poem presents a picture of king and queen, united for the benefit of the kingdom. Accomplished as she is, the greatest praise for the worthy wife receives is that she fears the Lord. She stands in reverent awe before the God who governs all things. Though the advice is given to a king, the portrait of a strong, ideal woman has been applied to worthy wives in general. This text is traditionally recited by Jewish men to their wives on Sabbath evenings and is often part of funeral services for women. Notes to the left. This is an exhortation in praise of strong women. Think of a woman you know personally, as I've mentioned. You can do the same. Take your time with this reading. And, and really uh, let the words sink in. A couple of words to be concerned with, distaff and spindle. Those are um, just part of the uh, the, the wool making uh, and, and the wool making tools that they had. It asks you to heighten this line because her care extends beyond her family. So that's the only line that really talks about that, but it's important. And then it says, dismiss these as worthless, and those being charm, beauty, and um, and then with conviction we end it. A reading from the book of Proverbs. 
When one finds a worthy wife, her value is far beyond pearls. Her husband, entrusting his heart to her, has an unfailing prize. She brings him good and not evil all the days of her life. She obtains wool and flax and works with loving hands. She puts her hands to the distaff and her spindles ply and her fingers ply the spindle. She reaches out her hands to the poor and extends her arms to the needy. Charm is deceptive and beauty fleeting. The woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a reward for her labors and let her works praise her at the city gates. The word of the Lord. We'll mention that the, the psalm which follows 128 is, off, is, uh, is, is nicknamed the wedding psalm and it talks about uh, the two becoming one and it talks about your children like olive plants. I always think as we, we, we have olive trees out here where mm-hmm. we live and, and you see those little clusters of shoots that come up around and those that's that's the image. For, so for us it's pretty vivid. People who live in St. Louis or something probably never seen an olive tree but that but we can do that. Yeah. You're blessed. Yeah. The commentary for reading two. Paul's Thessalonian community is awaiting the day of the Lord. In the Jewish tradition, particularly in later prophetic literature, the day of the Lord refers to the time of God's absolute judgment, a future event in which the power and justice of God will be revealed, with evil conquered and good rewarded. Sometimes the vision includes cosmic upheaval and other times earthly tribulation. In common with other apocalyptic texts in the Bible, the imagery is not intended to be taken literally, but employs a variety of emotion-filled illustrations to highlight God's power to overcome all evil. When this day of judgment will happen is uncertain, for it will come like an unexpected thief in the night. That it will happen is assured. Paul tells his new Christians that the best way to be prepared is to be children of the day, always remaining alert and sober. Paul rarely cites Jesus' own teaching, yet when he writes here about the day of the Lord, we hear echoes of Jesus' apocalyptic discourse. Jesus and Paul use common imagery typical of other Jewish writings, dramatic calamities, pains like a woman in labor, contrast between the darkness and light, an unknown day and hour. The language is sharp and readily draws us into the scenes. Though the images are frightening, both Jesus and Paul use them to encourage disciples to remain faithful until the end. Paul has good reason to write about the day of the Lord and the expectation of, the, of Jesus' return, Herusia. The Thessalonians offers us the earliest picture of the problems associated with misguided understanding and excessive focus on God's future coming as judge and redeemer. The community was more anxious than joyful, more fearful than hopeful. A similar misunderstanding has led repeatedly to dire predictions, judgments regarding who will be saved, and calculating the precise date of the end of the world. Paul's exhortation to the community states clearly that we do not know when Christ will come again, and that here and now we should comfort one one another, living in steadfast and sure hope. Again, the word hope comes in. And uh, this reading encouraging is encouraging the assembly not to be concerned with the end time, but to continue to live out of our true identity in Christ. This is not new information, though. Um, emphasize that your community already knows that concerning the times and seasons, we have no need for anything to be written to you. Um, 
So slowly in the end, slowly with emphasis, really inspire your community. community. We can do this. <laughs> so let's see how well we can do this. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Concerning times and seasons, brothers and sisters, you have no need for anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief at night. When people are saying peace and security, then sudden disaster comes upon them like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness for that, for that day to overtake you like a thief. For all of you are children of the light and the child of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us stay alert and sober. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we move on to the reading of the gospel. And uh, we're almost through with our gospel of Matthew. Uh, got one more week and then uh, we go into the gospel of Mark, cycle, cycle uh, B. B. Yeah, cycle B. So this gospel, I'm commentary at the bottom of 284. In Thessalonians, Paul exhorts the community to be prepared for the day of the Lord by remaining alert and sober. Paired with the parable in today's gospel, we learn that being alert and sober is not a passive stance of simply waiting patiently for the Lord's coming. Preparedness involves working according to one's capability, faithfulness, and taking responsibility. Jesus introduces the parable simply. A man goes on a journey. A man going on a journey calls his servants together before departing. He entrusts his possessions to them and gives each talents based on their abilities. A talent in, Ju- in the Judaism of Jesus' day is a monetary union, unit of high value, variable depending on the metal used as well as its place of origin. Even one talent gives the servant a significant amount of money, and the master rightfully expects a return on his investment. It's easy to see that the master represents the Lord who will return and judge the actions of his servants. The first two have increased the original talents and earned the master's praise first with one exclamation, well done. They are good and faithful. The first term affirms that the servants who have acted responsibly in accordance with the master's will. The second is that they have been dependable and trustworthy. The master refers to each of them as my good and faithful servant, highlighting his personal relationship with them. It is his own joy that they will share. What a strong contrast with the terms he uses to describe the third servant. He's wicked, lazy, and useless. The three words together paint a picture of one whose lack of action squanders the master's gift and is contrary to the master's intentions. The relationship is severed. You, wicked servant, not my servant. The servant himself uses a word that sums up the reason for his failure. Fear. His fear has led him to view the master only as harsh and to hide all that he received. Both the positive and negative portraits can act as incentives to be always prepared for the Lord's coming, whether that be in here or now at his final appearance. You know, so the word talent, you know, has a specific meaning in our English language. And, mm-hmm. and I never really knew knew that it was, a, you know, a monetary thing when I was young. I heard the gospel, you know, okay, I've got all these talents and I've got to use them. And I, for some reason, I really remember this. I was like, okay, I have to use all my, my talents. And, and uh, I still think that's right, though. Yeah, I do, too. I think that God, God gave us skills and talents and tendencies uh, to... to uh, to do and, and, and when we when we find those things an opportunity to exercise those things it's a really it's a God thing so let me read this gospel a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew Jesus told his disciples this parable 
A man going on a journey called in his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to a third one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Immediately the one who received five talents went and traded with them and made another five. Likewise the one who received two made another two. But the man who received one went off and dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came forward, bringing the additional five. He said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come, share your master's joy. Then the one who had received two talents also came forward and said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come, share your master's joy. Then the one who received the one talent came forward and said, Master, I knew you were a demanding person, harvesting where you did not plant and gathering where you did not scatter. So out of fear, I went off and buried your talent in the ground. Here it is back. His master said to him in reply, You wicked, lazy servant! So you knew that I harvest where I do not plant and gather where I did not scatter. Should you not have put money, put my money in the bank so that I could have gotten it back with interest on my return? Now then, take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten. For everyone who has, more will be given and he will grow rich. But the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and throw this useless servant into the darkness outside where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Harsh words. <laughs> okay, we've got to use those talents and, and use all the all that God has given us. But uh, yeah, I think I think it's something to think to think about. You know, we especially those uh, who, you know, as Americans just in general. You know, we have we live in a privileged society, and He's really given us a lot. And we have we have a lot to do, and um, maybe sometimes as we're relaxing on our couch, watching television or something, maybe there's better ways for us to to spend this time and this energy and things that He's given to us. So that's enough preaching for me, because that's not my job. <laughs> um, but all of your job is to prepare these readings, and uh, pray that God would bless you all. Thanks. Mm-hmm.